close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. All systems are go for launch at this time. T minus 10, 9, 8. We have a go for engine start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of Columbia on a multi-nation research flight. Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Air Station, the primary home of America's space program for over 40 years. Since the first American satellite was launched in 1958, the facilities at Cape Canaveral have supported some of the most historic missions in space exploration. From Alan Shepard, the first American to fly into space, through Neil Armstrong, the first man to set foot on the moon, to today's space shuttle and unmanned satellite launches. NASA and the United States Air Force provide the support facilities at the Cape, which have played a crucial role in the success of every mission. In 1961, Alan Shepard departed from his quarters at Hangar S to begin America's journey into space. 37 years later, Hangar S continues to play an important, if different, role in the space program. Right next door is Hangar AE, which houses the Mission Directors Center and Payload Processing Facility for some unmanned flights. It also contains a secret that has never before been seen on video, but it doesn't have anything to do with crashed UFOs. Ready. Since, after all, this is rocket science, NASA must downlink a tremendous amount of data from each spacecraft during ground tests, through the countdown and liftoff, and out into space. There is no room for error in the acquisition and processing of this data. It must be accurately calculated and reliably sent from this hangar to distant space centers around the world participating in the mission, all in real time and without interruption. Since hangar AE also supports some telemetry from the space shuttle, that importance is even greater since human lives are on the line. NASA is used to solving technical problems, but starting more than 10 years ago, the space program faced a different set of challenges. Budget cutbacks forced NASA to do more with less, without sacrificing quality, or mission safety. The most innovative solution to these data processing needs came from an unexpected source, the Amiga. That's right, since their introduction in 1986, Amiga computers have been used for the most demanding job on or off the planet. Thanks to the efforts of Space Coast Amiga member Hal Greenlee and retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Johnson, Amiga Atlanta was allowed an exclusive television tour of this secure government facility. We saw our favorite computers in action during the flight of the Space Shuttle Endeavor to the Russian Mir space station. We take in all of the, the telemetry data. Sometimes we have to scale it, applying coefficients up to fifth order polynomials wow. to convert them back to engineering units, and then we generate displays. In this case, we're showing what they are in percent and in engineering units, which is after we've converted them. The first choice was the Macintosh, mm -hmm. but it was a closed system. They wouldn't give us enough information to get into it at the level that we needed to. We looked at the PCs and the PC hardware architecture was really about as bad then as it is now. So uh, then Hal, I think, was the first one that brought out an Amiga. He yeah, snapped up one of the old 1000s and we played around it. I brought it out and showed it to Dave Brown in about a month or two. It didn't pass before Dave had one of his own. And, and I went we out were, and bought one, I was about yeah. the third one. We were, we were both talking to Skip, we need to get some of these babies, you know, because there is this expansion box that will allow us to add hard drives and all the other stuff. We need to get them and find out if we can't make them work for their job. And Commodore was easy to work with back then. I mean, when we asked for documentation, they sent us a stack of documentation probably about four <laughs> feet high. They were, they were willing to tell us everything about their machine. So since we had to design some custom hardware to go with it, mm -hmm. it really helped to know exactly how everything worked. And so. It just turned out that it was a good machine. You know, the, it's funny, the things that make a, a machine good for playing games mm -hmm. tend to make it good for processing and displaying data because you got some of the same problems. You know, you, you need a, an operating system that's very efficient, very fast, and uh, the Amiga has that and it's got very little overhead. That's what makes it nice. We don't load down the system running the overhead. We can just go ahead and process the data. Most of our customizing is hardware customizing. We, the, the Amiga operating system is flexible enough. We, we have to drop into assembly 
once in a while just to, to set up or initialize some of the special boards or mm -hmm. chips that we use. Right. But other than that, the operating system's fine. We don't do anything unusual with it. We use it just like it is. We just build our own hardware for our interfacing requirements because we have to pull the data out of the data bus in this building mm -hmm. and we have to then be able to put the data back in. Seven Amigas are online assigned to operational support. Six are dedicated to routing data to remote space centers and another six are reserved for hardware and software development. We support all of the Atlas Centaurs. We're supporting Delta II. We're getting ready for Delta III. We support the uh, Orbital Sciences Pegasus, the Lockheed Martin Athena. Uh, we've supported a couple of Titans. We support uh, some data off the shuttle. We don't directly support the shuttle. We do support some user data off the shuttle. Ghost spacecraft data, GPS spacecraft data. The interesting thing too on the Amiga because of the way it's laid out, mm -hmm. if the bit rates aren't too high, we can actually support more than one of those at a time in the same machine. More than one spacecraft? Yeah, because the software is all tied together. Even though the Amigas play an important role in handling telemetry, they are versatile enough to interface with other NASA computers figured out a way how to transfer files from Amiga to a Sun. He found it somewhere on the, on the bulletin board, a, a program that would convert the, uh, the files I had on the Amiga, the source, the source files, to an archive, and then from that archive I, I could transfer it on the, on the Sun machine, and then we're just making a few minor adjustments to the top of the, of the program and the, the clear statements. I could compile it and run it on the, the Sun. So I did all the all the debugging back here on the Amiga and then took it to the Sun. If it's not a PC, NASA gives us a lot of grief when we try to buy anything to go with it. They want us to, to buy PCs and run Windows 95 and NT. We keep trying to tell them it's not fast enough, so then they tell us to buy DEC Alphas. We tell them that's too expensive. They don't like the Amiga. It doesn't cost enough. Well, this, this is data coming down right now from the uh, shuttle, the STS-89 flight, the one that Doc was docked with Mir up until yesterday. And this is just some of the environmental parameters that the life sciences people use. They use, they, in fact, it's interesting to me, they take this data, we send it, we process it with the Amiga, and we remote it to them to another Amiga, mm -hmm. which then pulls up data and sends it to their PC, which controls an environmental chamber, so that they can duplicate the environmental conditions on the shuttle here, except for gravity. So that's their control group. They have. They can have a group of animals or insects or whatever on the shuttle in zero G, and then they can have the same animals in the same environmental conditions with normal G, it's about five hangers down the road from here. And they use the Amiga data is what they use to control their growth chamber to keep the environment the same. In the NASA Amigas, custom interface hardware is built and used inside, but the most important difference between their Amigas and ours is on the outside. So that you can't accidentally push the power button. We were afraid that button was just a little too exposed on the front, so we armor plated it. Yeah. On the 4000s, we're using 3.1. Uh, on, on the 2000s that we're running, we're still running uh, 2.1. I just want to show you the TV center I was talking about before. Yeah. Even after seeing Amiga's hard at work in the telemetry lab, another surprise was found in the television center. We still have a toaster system. What do you use the toaster for? We add titles and stuff during the launch. We might do an effect or two just, just by way of making the tape look more interesting. But mainly the toaster is used to overlay uh, perhaps time or camera angle or something like that, some kind of text data that they want to add to the picture. 300 television monitors are fed by a routing system large enough to run a commercial TV network. In addition to video, it can also route data over the entire space center. What are your plans for the future? We got a, a, another Titan coming up that we have to write software for. We're having we're in the process of writing software right now for next generation the Delta. Uh, we've got Atlas Centaur supposed to put Russian engines in sometime soon, and we're going to have to do a rewrite for that. Build a new display capability on the on the user end that will be driven by the Amigas. We'll send them the data over an Ethernet system and they'll use PCs just to do displays. Although not as easy to purchase and support as other microcomputers, 
Gary and his team remain cautious about Gateway's purchase of the Amiga platform. Uh, I think we've gotten a little feedback from Hal on it. We haven't been in contact. If we start seeing that they're actually shipping some hardware, we'll get interested then. But again, it'll be a, it's an uphill battle trying to convince NASA that they want to go with something other than one of the standard accepted platforms. Six. Main engine start. Two. One. Zero. And liftoff. So the next time you see a space shuttle launch, you can tell your friends which personal computer is rated for mission critical use in the United States space program. This is Bob Castro reporting for Amiga Atlanta at the Cape Canaveral Air Station, Florida. This program has been a presentation of Amiga Atlanta Incorporated.